everyone, and welcome from the European Medicines Agency in Amsterdam to this press briefing today. Our safety committee, the Prague, concluded its review of the rare cases of uh, blood clots in people who received the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine and that have been observed in many EU member states. During this press briefing, we will inform you about the outcome of the discussion by the Prague and details of the assessment. My name is Maria Agnes Heine, and I'm the head of EMA's communication department. I'm very delighted to have with me today uh, Mrs. Ima Cook, the executive director of the European Medicines Agency, Dr. Sabine Strauss, the chair of EMA Safety Committee, the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee, Prague, and Dr. Peter Arlet, the head of analytics at EMA, who can provide additional information about the review and the scientific evidence it was based on. Before we start, I want to explain how we plan to run this press briefing. So please note that your microphone is disabled by default for the duration of the press briefing. We will first hear short remarks of Mrs. Cook and Dr. Strauss, and after that we will have half an hour about for questions. Once the question and answer session starts, please raise your hand in Webex if you want to raise a question. Today's briefing is broadcast via YouTube and Europe by satellite. The footage can be used free of charge by all media, and you will find the respective links in the invite sent earlier today. Without further delay, I'm now handing over to Mrs. Ima Cook, the Executive Director of EMA. Mrs. Cook, please. Thank you very much, Mrs. Heine. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us again for this press briefing. First of all, I want to start by stating that our safety committee, the Pharmacovigilance and Risk Assessment Committee of the European Medicines Agency, has confirmed that the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine in preventing COVID-19 overall outweigh the risks of side effects. COVID-19 is a very serious disease with high hospitalization and death rates, and every day COVID is still causing thousands of deaths across the EU. This vaccine has proven to be highly effective. It prevents severe disease and hospitalization, and it is saving lives. Vaccination is extremely important in helping us in the fight against COVID-19, and we need to use the vaccines we have to protect us from the devastating effects. The Prague, after a very in-depth analysis, has concluded that the reported cases of unusual blood clotting following vaccination with the AstraZeneca vaccine should be listed as possible side effects of the vaccine. As, as we communicated last week, we convened an ad hoc expert group composed of experts from a range of medical specialities, including hematologists, neurologists, epidemiologists and virologists. Based on the current available evidence, Specific risk factors such as age, gender, or previous medical history of, of clotting disorders have not been able to be confirmed as the rarest events are seen in all ages and in men and women. A plausible explanation for these rare side events is that uh, is an immune response to the vaccine leading to a condition similar to one seen sometimes in patients treated with heparin. It's called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And Dr. Strauss will give us more details from the assessment. EMA is working very closely with the national competent authorities in all the EU member states and the company to make sure that these risks are proactively communicated to healthcare professionals. It's important that both vaccinated people and healthcare professionals are aware of the signs and symptoms of these unusual blood clotting disorders so that they can be spotted quickly to minimize any possible risks. We will continue to monitor the scientific evidence available on both effectiveness and safety of all the authorized COVID-19 vaccines, and we will issue further recommendations if necessary on the grounds of science and robust evidence. This case clearly demonstrates one of the challenges posed by large-scale vaccination campaigns. 
When millions of people receive these vaccines, very rare events can occur that were not identified during the clinical trials. The role of pharmacovigilance, the monitoring of these side effects, is to help us to rapidly detect and analyze these risks and their impact on the benefit risk profile of the vaccine. This case also shows us that our pharmacovigilance system is working. These very rare and unusual events have been picked up, identified, analyzed, and have allowed us to come to science-based recommendations to allow the safe and effective use of this vaccine. EMA's scientific assessment will continue to, to work on all recommendations around this vaccine. Any national decision on the optimal use in vaccination campaigns will also take into account the pandemic situation in any individual country and other factors such as hospitalization and availability of vaccines. So thank you very much for joining us today and I'm now very pleased to hand over to the Chair of our Pharmacovigilance and Risk Assessment Committee, Dr. Sabina Strauss. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cook, and good afternoon. Over the past few weeks, the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee, PRAC, that I chair, has analyzed reports of blood clots in people who received the COVID-19 vaccine, AstraZeneca. As Ms. Cook said, the PRAC has confirmed that overall, the benefits of the vaccine from AstraZeneca in preventing COVID-19 are well established and the risks are very rare. The PROC has conducted a very thorough review of the reports of rare and unusual blood clotting events in combination with low blood, plat uh, low blood platelets with the help of an ad -hoc, ad hoc expert group that looked at the data in great, great detail. The committee has carried out a detailed review of the 62 cases of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and 24 cases of splenchic vein thrombosis in the European Union Drug Safety Database, UDA Vigilance. As of March 22, and 18 of these cases, of these cases were fatal. The cases came mainly from reporting systems of the European Economic Area and the UK. I can provide you also with more recent figures as of April, 20, uh, April 4, 2021, the EU Drug Safety Database had received a total of 169 cases of CVST and 53 of splenchic vein thrombosis. And at that moment, 34 million people were vaccinated in the European Economic Area and the UK. The more recent data did not change any of the PRAC recommendations. After extensive discussions within the committee and taking into account the findings of the expert group, our conclusion is that these clotting disorders are very rare side effects of the vaccine. This conclusion is based on the detailed clinical, mechanistic and epidemiological assessment, including a distinct clinical pattern, immunological findings and observation of more reported cases and would be expected from the background rates of these unusual conditions. The currently available data did not allow us to identify a definite cause for these complications. However, plausible, plausible explanations have been put forward, including an immune response that leads to a condition that seems similar to an atypical heparin-induced thrombocytopenia hit. No specific risk factors could be identified based on the current data. The committee can therefore not recommend any specific measures to reduce the risk. Most of the cases occurred in individuals below 60 years of age and in women, but because of the different ways the vaccine is being used in the different countries, the committee did not conclude that age and gender were clear risk factors for these very rare side effects. Importantly, further research analysis will, uh, of this important issue will take place. The manufacturer, AstraZeneca, will have to conduct studies and research 
uh, has been commissioned by EMA to further investigate these reactions. The committee will continue to assess all evidence that becomes available on this issue while the vaccination campaigns continue. It is of great importance that healthcare professionals and people coming for vaccination are aware of these risks and look out for possible signs or symptoms that usually occur in the first two weeks following vaccination. These include, uh, for example, shortness of breath, chest pain, swelling in the leg, persistent abdominal pain, neurological symptoms, including severe or persistent headache or blurred vision and skin bruising beyond the site of injection. The product information will be updated to reflect these new findings uh, and um, uh, will, this will be added as an adverse drug reaction to the product information. And it will also include warnings. I would like to thank all the colleagues that have worked very, very hard around the clock uh, to provide a comprehensive review of all the evidence that was available to the committee and for the assessment, which was both rapid and robust. The collaboration between the colleagues from the national competent authorities and the European Medicines Agency, as well as with the scientific expert, was extremely productive. This review shows that in Europe there is a strong pharmacovigilance system that can promptly detect and analyze any adverse event, even the very rare ones, and take appropriate action. And I would like to take the opportunity here to stress again the importance of reporting of any suspected side effect. It is based on the reports from healthcare professionals and from people vaccinated that we have been able to detect, assess and act in this rapid, robust way. I'm pleased to leave the floor now to our moderator. Many thanks, Dr. Strauss and Mrs. Cook. We are now opening the floor for questions. So if you want to ask a question, please click on the raise hand icon, which appears when you move your mouse over your name in the participant list in WebEx. And when I give you the floor, you please unmute yourself and turn on the camera. So the first question today comes from Gillian Deutsch from Politico. Gillian, please. Hi, thank you very much for the time. Um, I have two questions, if you allow me. Um, my first question is you said that there's no um, specific indication that there is a specific gender or age more at risk of these rare blood clotting events. But I have to say, I'm a young woman. I'm 27 years old. I'm seeing plenty of, of reports of young women with serious, sometimes fatal blood clots. Um, and there are plenty more women like me in Europe. I'm wondering if you can explain to me why I and other young women like me should confidently receive the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine if it is offered to me. The second question I want to ask is that, the, that Europe remains one of the most vaccine-skeptic continents in the world. Will allowing a vaccine that does increase, increase the risk of potentially fatal blood clots, even if very rare, if we allow that to remain on the market, will that have an, an increasingly negative effect on vaccine confidence um, in the continent? Thank you. Thanks, Gillian. And probably we split this message, so uh, perhaps Dr. Strauss can first respond to uh, the advice to young women, and then we can go forward with Mrs. Cook about the vaccine hesitancy. Thank you very much. It's an important question and also a very difficult one. Um, what we have seen so far is that, indeed, the risk seems to be predominantly in younger age, uh, 60 years and younger, but it also occurs in the elderly, and we have seen that it predominantly affects women. Some of that could be explained by the way that the vaccine is being used in the European Union and the European economic area. Um, what we do know is that COVID-19 is a very serious disease, and we know that the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine have been established. They preve it prevents COVID disease, it prevents hospitalization, and it prevents mortality. So from that, in that respect, um, PROC feels that the overall benefits outweigh the risks. Mrs. Cook, can you perhaps go on? Yes, I think it's very important that we use the vaccines that we have available to us. We need to beat this pandemic. We need to um, make sure that people have confidence in the vaccines. These are rare, these are very rare side effects. Um, 
the risk of mortality from COVID is much greater than the risk of uh, mortality from these side effects. I think it's, it's important that we give the message that uh, vaccines will help us in the fight against COVID and we need to continue to use these vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Natasha Futi from Euractive. Natasha, please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, great. Thank you very much. Um, just following on um, from Gillian's question um, regarding young women. So I appreciate that it's not been enough uh, to say that this is a risk factor. But when there are other vaccines available in countries, um, wouldn't it be prudent, in the EMA's opinion, um, for maybe countries to prioritize other vaccines over the Astra uh, AstraZeneca vaccine for young women, um, if that option is available? Uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting for more studies to be done. Um, and my other question is, there's currently reports that uh, countries will, that might look to mix the vaccines. For example, in the UK, they've done the first dose of a lot of AstraZeneca vaccines and may then look to mix with another vaccine for the second dose. Is there already guidelines from the EMA on this? Is this safe? And is this most importantly, is it, and also importantly, is this effective as a strategy? Thank you. Thanks, Natasha. The first question is going to be responded to by Dr. Strauss, and the second one I'm going to give to Dr. Arlet. Thank you for the question. I think um, it's a, also a very relevant question and a difficult one to answer. Well, not so difficult from our perspective. What we have done is we have very, very carefully assessed all the data that were available to us. We um, discussed these with um, experts in the field, and we have concluded that there is indeed a possibility of a very rare event that might occur. And what we have tried to do is to provide the information that we have available to the best of our knowledge and um, uh, to add that to the product information. Based on that information, I think we have benefits that have been assessed in the clinical trials that show that um, AstraZeneca is effective in preventing COVID disease and its further consequences. And we have added uh, um, a very carefully analyzed risk that is very, very rare. Um, the frequency is um, difficult to assess yet, but we feel that if you state that the reporting rate is approximately one in 100,000 or even a little bit higher, that would reflect the risk. And based on that information, we, leave, um, we ask uh, national uh, vaccination uh, authorities, they can make up their minds on who they would like to vaccinate with which kind of vaccine. Um, so that's uh, the first part of your question, I think. Thanks, Dr. Strauss. Dr. Arlet, can you perhaps report, uh, talk about the guidelines? Thanks very much indeed. Uh, yes, EMA hasn't issued guidelines as such relating to uh, mixing and matching different vaccines between the first and second dose. There's a lot of discussion on this, um, and I think that's being driven particularly by the need to optimise the use of relatively limited availability of the, the different uh, vaccines that have been authorised. Um, there is a theoretical reason to think that mixing vaccines could work and could be an, a safe and effective uh, approach. However, no data has been submitted to the European Medicines Agency, and we haven't made an assessment, therefore, of these specific vaccines for COVID-19. If such data becomes available, we will, of course, immediately assess it uh, and issue any statements uh, as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for those who missed the name, it's Dr. Peter Arlet, who is the head of analytics at the EMA. Okay, the next question is going to come from uh, Laura Kostan from the German broadcaster ARD. Uh, Lauren, please. We cannot hear you. Do you speak? If not, I'm going to the next person first, and we can take uh, Laura later. 
Then I'm going to call uh, Gerardo D'Amico from Rai TV. Gerardo? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. I would like to know if uh, the statistical excess of cerebral thrombosis uh, um, has been uh, rigorously demonstrated uh, and uh, uh, which uh, on populations. And then, uh, if possible, I would like to know uh, the opinion of the agency on replacing the second dose of vaccine, for example, AstraZeneca, with another preparation, for example, Pfizer. I would like to know um, if this uh, makes uh, immunological sense for you, but also if you think uh, it is ethical since uh, um, it is a practice beyond uh, any experimentation carried on. Thank you. Many thanks. Dr. Strauss, please. I think as for the mixing and matching of vaccines, Dr. Peter Arlett already provided uh, the information that we don't have uh, data available to make a recommendation, um, but we're looking forward to receiving those data. And um, as for the second dose, what we do know about the cases of CVST is that they have occurred up until now after the first dose. But that might also be due to the fact that we don't have as much information available on the second dose because people are getting their second dose as about now and uh, even further on in the future they will receive a second dose. So for the moment we can only provide the information that we have the cases of CVST after the first dose. Thank you very much. So next is uh, Yanis Palaiologos from Katir Katemirini. Yanis, please. Hi there. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Great. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, you say that no uh, risk factors have been identified, but that most cases are women uh, under the age of 60. Does that mean that uh, people older than 60, older than 65 should feel that they are less at risk than even the one in 100,000 or that or is that not the case? Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Strauss, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, that's a very fair question. Um, but at the moment, it's very difficult to say anything. Like I um, explained is that um, the exposure to the vaccine is different in the different member states. It's different between, for example, the European Economic Area and the UK. So it's um, partly it might be due to the fact that more women have been vaccinated. We know that in the different member states, approximately 60% of all vaccinees is female. But it might also be due to a, a certain other factors that we have not been able to identify yet. Thanks, Dr. Strauss. I'm now taking the question of Laura Kostan, who has put it in the chat. So um, she is asking... You mentioned no common factors were identified among the cases. Why is that? Are the data evaluated not specific enough or not enough cases reported yet in order to identify common aspects? Another question for you, Dr. Strauss. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, the cases that we have evaluated, the 62, together with the um, uh, expert group, those cases were uh, quite, uh, provided quite good and extensive information. But nevertheless, the number is very limited. On the one hand, that's, of course, very good and fortunate that the number of cases is limited. At the same time, that also um, makes it very difficult to find common factors. And on the other hand, um, what we also know is of a lot of cases that are spontaneously reported, they are not as complete as we would like to have them uh, in order to further anal analyze them. And um, so I would like to repeat again my uh, kind request for, for people who suspect that they might have a side effect. Please report it and report it as extensively and as complete as possible. Thank you very much. So the next uh, journalist to ask a question is Roland Termote from The Standard. Roland, please. Hi. Can you 
Yeah, okay. Um, well, my question is just to be very clear, um, you've stated that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks and the risk of mortality from COVID is much greater than the risk of mortality from these uh, rare side effects of the vaccine. Uh, but does this still hold true when we only consider this specific group of, uh, let's say, women under 60? Does the risk of mortality or, or severe side effects for this particular group, only within this particular group, um, does the risk of, of severe side effects or mortality from COVID-19 outweigh the risk uh, associated with the, the vaccine for this very specific group? Dr. Strauss, please. Thank you. At the moment, that's something that's very difficult to uh, answer because the clinical trials have not been performed uh, age-specific. Uh, um, well, they have been performed, but we do not have all the age-stratified uh, data available. It's something that uh, is part of our further research and further investigation uh, concerning this vaccine. But we do know that the risk is very low. Sorry. Thanks, Dr. Strauss. The next question is coming from Nomi Kreske from Bloomberg. Nomi, please. Can you hear me? Yes, Hi, now we can you. hear you. Yeah. Hi, great. Um, I'm just wondering whether your assessment on this vaccine would be different if other vaccines for COVID were more broadly available in Europe. And if you could also give us an example for another drug or vaccine that's broadly given for healthy people that might have a similar risk or a similar side effect, just so that we can sort of tell our readers what this, this might be similar to. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I give that question to Dr. Arlet. So the important thing to remember is to go back to basics in terms of benefit risk. So, as has been mentioned, COVID is causing many thousands of deaths every day across the EU. We have um, a number of vaccines authorised in the European Union, all of which have demonstrated effectiveness at preventing severe disease, and they are preventing deaths. In the case of the AstraZeneca vaccine, we have now identified a very rare uh, side effect. And if we then put that into the context of the overall benefits of the vaccine, then the benefits outweigh the risks. Now, um, the, how vaccines are used and deployed by different member states, of course, is going to be impacted by the availability of vaccines, by the local infection rates, by hospital capacity, by who's already been vaccinated, and these decisions will uh, be driven by all of those factors put together. Um, the uh, last question, Mary Agnes, can you remind me, please? Uh, a re a, an example to compare to, yes, indeed. Um, so perhaps um, an example that you might like to reflect on would be um, the use of the combined uh, oral contraceptive, the combined hormonal contraceptive, and blood clots that occur with uh, contraceptives. Now, these are given to uh, women who are normally otherwise healthy, although obviously in, in a big population some of those women will have other risk factors and other conditions. Um, and if we treat 10,000 women um, with uh, combined uh, hormonal contraceptive for a year, we'll see four excess uh, blood clots in that year. So that just gives a, a benchmark of another medicine given to a healthy population, which causes a side effect, um, which occurs uh, rarely, um, but that we need to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Donato Mancini from the Financial Times. Donato, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just following up on Jenny and Natasha from earlier. Is it possible you might be recommending another vaccine is used in certain age groups further down the line when you get more data? I mean, you might, you might be aware of the fact that the UK is advising Another shot is used in 18 to 29-year-olds, and aren't you concerned that Europeans will be very confused by the fact that there's no UI guidance, but, you know, there are limitations in place? The other question that I had is, what studies exactly have you asked AstraZeneca to carry out? And the last one, sorry, um, is there any indication this might be caused by the type of vaccine 
at hand? And if so, could this be an issue for J and J? And are you closely reviewing that? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Three questions in one. So I think different people are going to respond to different questions. So I start with Mrs. Cook. Um, sorry. So the question as to um, the recommendations in different uh, in different populations. Yes, of course. Once we have if we have additional information, we will review it. Uh, in the context of the uh, uh, of, of the populations, and we're working very closely with the UK um, medicines and health re regulatory authority, who have also seen, uh, who have vaccinated, uh, uh, who are in the process of reviewing a lot of um, um, uh, outputs of the vaccinations strategy. Um, and um, we will that we will take that into account in any further uh, rev review. Um, with respect to the um, yeah, it, it's it's always a very difficult situation, and the situation evolves as one we have more information available, uh, two as more vaccines are available, and three as different risk groups are identified and uh, the general um, vaccination across the population changes. So we can expect that there will be new information and new recommendations as time goes on. Thanks, Mrs. Uh, Cook. I now hand over to Dr. Strauss. Thank you. To, to add to that, I think what we have done is we have... Uh, this is not unexpected. We know that we are rolling out vaccines in a very large scale, very many healthy people. And the difficulty is we'll see events occurring, um, some of them just by chance, temporarily associated, and some of them like this one, that might be indeed an adverse effect from the vaccine. What we try to do is to take every piece of evidence, very carefully assess that, and then provide information via the uh, product information and the patient leaflet, um, so that everybody is aware of what are the risks of a vaccine, what are the benefits of the vaccines. And then, um, of course, like it was highlighted, national authorities take decisions based on the status uh, in their uh, member state, the infection rate, the pandemic situation, and the availability of other vaccines. But what we try to do, and hopefully we are good at that and we will succeed in that, is to provide all the information that's available on both the benefits and the risks for the different vaccines. Do you want to add something? Oh, no, Dr. Arlet, you can add perhaps on the studies that uh, AZ has to uh, carry out now. Happy to comment on that, yes. Um, the uh, PRAC has um, Im or will be imposing on AstraZeneca, the manufacturer, seen a number of studies to ensure that we uh, get robust data to evaluate uh, this uh, safety issue. Um, firstly, the company will need to do um, mechanistic studies, so laboratory studies, to try and better understand the effect of the vaccine with the clotting system. Um, secondly, the company will need to look at their existing data from closed clinical trials to see if that can give any further information on possible mechanism risk factors uh, and so on. Thirdly, ongoing clinical trials, um, there should be consideration of how further data can be collected so that we can learn from them. And the company should also um, conduct epidemiological studies. I think maybe it's important to say that we are not relying just on the company, we are complementing that. And at a European level, um, the European Medicines Agency is uh, supporting studies but to be conducted by two large academic consortia one led by the University of Erasmus in Rotterdam, uh, the other by Utrecht University, which will be looking particularly at um, uh, normal healthcare data, looking at uh, risk factors for thrombosis um, with COVID disease and comparing those that are vaccinated with those that aren't vaccinated. And we would anticipate results starting to come in from, uh, from those over the next couple of months. Thank you. The next question comes from Maria Cheng from Associated Press. Maria, please. Hi, um, can you hear me? 
Yes, we do. Hi, can you hear me? Um, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I was just wondering if you've looked at the um, connection to estrogen, since outside of COVID, uh, CVST is primarily in women. Uh, I wondered if you'd um, found anything on that. Thank you. Dr. Strauss, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, you're quite right. Um, CVT, as such, occurs mainly in younger women, and one of the major risk factors is oral contraception or pregnancy. Um, what we have seen here, according to the experts, is a different clinical picture. picture. It's a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and it is accompanied very often with thrombocytopenia. So they felt that this is a completely different picture and that there is no way of um, saying that an oral contraceptive or pregnancy, which is, of course, not completely um, uh, opportune at the moment, but um, is a risk factor for these specific uh, uh, cases that we have observed. Thank you very much. Now we have a question from Kai Kupferschmidt from Science. Kai, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, two quick questions, if I may. So, first of all, the MHRA, um, when asked about the frequency, said something like four in a million. So, uh, you know, around one in 250,000. We heard earlier about one in 100,000 or thereabouts. Can, can you give an idea of, of what the realistic kind of confidence interval is here? Like, like be between what values, you know, would you expect this to end up giving the data you have? And then the other question I just wanted to ask, whether there's any information on how the treatment of this particular of these particular side effects has evolved, do you have any data to suggest that you know knowing this possibly hit like mechanism has helped avert further deaths? Do you have any any data at all on that? Thanks, uh, Dr. Strauss, please. Uh, first of all, I think what we are talking about is a reporting rate, and that's, of course, very dependent on how uh, cases are reported, and that's why I, again, um, requested that people who uh, think they might experience an adverse event please report and report as extensively as possible. Um, so it's not an incidence rate that we can provide at the moment. It's a reporting rate. Uh, what we do know is that CVST is rare. Um, at the moment, the uh, most up-to-date uh, estimation of CVST in the background is one to two per 100,000. Um, so we have here a reporting rate. It varies very much, like I said, with how good the reporting system in a member state is and how good um, cases are being identified. But what we see is, uh, I think, in Germany, a lot of work has been done, and I think uh, there is a reporting rate of one in 100,000, and that's what I was referring to. We know that in the UK the reporting rate is much lower, so um, that, that can have many, many uh, uh, causes. Uh, but for the moment, I think it's safe to assume that the reporting rate is around 1 in 100,000. Uh, I think in the UK it's 1 in 600,000, um, but it will be around that figure as a reporting rate. Oh, and the treatment. Yeah. Uh, we have discussed that very extensively with the experts, and it's very difficult. It's a difficult entity to treat. Uh, what we have heard is that um, it should be uh, that um, healthcare professionals should not use heparin if they suspect cases like this until a real hit has been excluded. Um, there might be a possibility to use other anticoagulants, but um, the scientific opinions are not aligned yet. And other possible treatments involve immunoglobulins and uh, uh, steroids and plasmapheresis. But at the moment, um, what we uh, recommend is that uh, colleagues look at the guidelines that are available uh, uh, from, uh, for example, the Hematology Society in the UK or other important uh, uh, societies in their own country. But there is no real treatment recommendation yet possible. Thank you very much. Now we have a um, question that came through the chat, which I'm going to give to Dr. Arlet. It comes from Loveday Morris from the Washington Post. 
If it is plausible that this is an immune response, are there any investigations into whether this is also an issue for similar vector vaccines such, such as J&J &J and Sputnik? Dr. Alet, please. Thanks very much. Um, the different uh, vaccines use different technologies and indeed um, there are the, the technology used by the AstraZeneca vaccine is used by others and, and uh, of those that are authorised in the EU, uh, the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine uses a similar technology based on adenovirus vector. Um, the uh, first thing to say is that during the clinical trials um, and in the assessment of those clinical trials at the time of authorization of Johnson & Johnson, there was an early sign of an increased risk of venous thromboembolism, not yet confirmed, but it is in the risk management plan for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, there have been three cases with the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine of blood clots associated with low platelets, which have some similarities to these cases that we've been described today for the AstraZeneca vaccine. However, the numbers are extremely small compared to the 4.5 million um, patients that have been, or, or vaccinees that have received uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine worldwide. This is, however, under close scrutiny. The PRAC is looking at it carefully, and I think it would be fair to say there's intensive monitoring of this issue across the vaccines. Um, I think I would leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question in the chat from uh, Aude Le Crubier from Medscape. The question is, I have heard that the way the vaccine is injected could be tied to these rare events, intravenous instead of intramuscular injections. Could you comment on this? Dr. Strauss, please. Yes, indeed. That has been discussed quite extensively. Um, of course, the, the uh, proper uh, administration is intramuscular, but there might be a mistake, and it could uh, be intravenously. Um, but from the experts, we have learned that the amount is so extremely small that that cannot be an explanation for uh, the adverse events that we have seen. Thank you. The next question comes from Francien Intema from NOS. Hi, thank you for my question. Yeah. I was wondering, I read um, in the press release a possible link with the vaccine. Um, in the press release in the Netherlands, I read it as well, but I hear you talking about a side effect. So I want to be very sure. Are we sure there is a causal link or not? And uh, another question, um, we got these numbers about the cases, and I would like to know if we can divide it up in men, uh, men and women. Thank you. Dr. Strauss? Yeah, thank you. And indeed, uh, sometimes our regulatory way of talking might be a little bit more complicated than it should be. Um, what we have learned from the review of the uh, very detailed review of the cases, that there is a strong association with the AstraZeneca vaccine and the adverse events. Um, and if we add something to 4.8, then that is a sign that we feel that there is a probable a causal association between the occurrence of the event and the administration of the vaccine. So that, that's a bit maybe a language issue where we fail um, uh, as regulators. So strongly associated is the word I would choose here. Um, and then the second question, I'm not sure that I understood it. The link. Uh, for both. For both. Yeah, for both. The next question comes from uh, Patrizia Antonini from ANSA. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the floor. Um, I, would, I would like to ask you something on Sputnik. I would like to know where you stand on, Sput on Sputnik assessment right now. If you're launching a probe on ethical problems on trials, uh, if you could give us some details on this. And what will be next vaccine that you will authorize uh, for the European market? What is in the pipeline? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Cook, please. Yes, thank you very much. And indeed, I think um, we've, we have announced that we started a rolling review of the Sputnik V vaccine. Uh, this means that we're currently looking at the available evidence to see whether it meets the uh, standards we would need for um, for evaluation in the EU. 
Um, possibly what you are referring to is that we've also, uh, we will be performing a good clinical practice inspection in, uh, in, in Russia. And this is, a, this is an evaluation of the way the trials were conducted that allowed the results to um, be, be generated. And this is a normal procedure that we follow for many vaccines and, and medicines, depending on our knowledge of um, uh, the uh, our, our knowledge of the um, trials that have been conducted, whether other authorities that we work with have, have also um, conducted similar um, in inspections. Uh, so it's something that's entirely normal in the context of our uh, evaluation process. Um, then with respect to the next vaccines in, uh, I, th that are likely to be authorized, what I can tell you is that in addition to the Sputnik uh, V vaccine, we have two other vaccines under rolling review. That's the CureVac vaccine and the Novavax vaccine. And uh, I have not got a crystal ball, so I'm not able to tell you which one of these, of any of the three, will be first in line. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question comes from Anja Ettel from Die Welt. Anja. Yes, hello. I hope you can hear me. Thanks for taking my questions. Yes. Um, I, I really have to insist because I still do not understand it, so I'm very sorry. But why did you not recommend a limited use for people under 30, like, for example, as British authorities just have? And what do you expect national authorities throughout the EU to, to do now? And uh, I would like to repeat the question of one of my colleagues. Could you please divide the 62 cases into age groups and gender? Thanks a lot. I give the question first to Mrs. Cook and then perhaps someone else can com compliment you. Yeah. Mrs. Cook, please. So, so Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this question. Uh, maybe I can mention a couple of things. Um, as we previously outlined, uh, the, this, the regulatory decision on the use of this vaccine is, as described in our package in, in information and our summary of product characteristics, and it, it outlines all the available information we have about this vaccine, what contraindications and what potential uh, side effects. Um, with respect to limitation to a specific population, this is something that we looked at in a lot of detail uh, through our ad hoc expert group and the evidence that uh, the available incidences that we had at the time did not allow to, uh, to draw any causal link between the different gender or, or age groups. Um, in the UK, I, I'm not, I cannot comment on what the decision making in the UK uh, to, to restrict to a certain age was, but I can tell you there's a lot more use in younger age groups in the UK than there is in the EU at the moment. And we will certainly uh, take this into account in our further evaluations. Oh, and sorry, I just wanted to add that we will also um, be discussing, we, we, we have been discussing with the national competent authorities in all our EU countries and we will have further discussions this evening uh, to, uh, to uh, discuss the outcomes of today's um, uh, evaluation and also the impact on possible vaccination strategies in the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next question comes from Jennifer Strasburg from Wall Street Journal. Jennifer, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, 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 I just, I still don't understand what you're saying about the... You need to close your micro, you know, your loudspeaker. There's an echo. Please. Thanks. Can you try again? Oh. 
Okay, if that is not working, we are going to take you later. So we uh, take now a question from Nomi O'Leary from the Irish Times. Nomi, please. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, Dr. Cook, previously you gave some nice figures on the incidence rate of these rare blood clot events um, in the various vaccines, and I think it was 4.8 in AstraZeneca, um, 0 0.2 in Pfizer-BioNTech, 0 in Moderna, but probably because of its low use. Do you have updated figures and also for Johnson & Johnson? Um, and can you also clarify what um, those rare blood clot cases are? I, I assume there we're talking about uh, CVST and the Splanchik one as well. Thank you. Thanks. I give this question to Dr. Strauss. She has the updated figures. Yeah, thank you. Um, for Johnson & Johnson, it was just highlighted um, that there were three cases post-marketing, and I think you mentioned, Dr. Arlitz, 4.4 million vaccinated, wasn't it? 4.5 vaccinated, so that's for Johnson & Johnson. Uh, for the Comirnaty, it's, uh, we have 35 cases of CVST, and we have an exposure noted at that same moment in time of 54 million. And for Moderna, we have five cases of CVST, and we have 4 million uh, vaccinations. Thank you very much. Dr. Arlet? Just to complement the... Um, data presented by uh, Dr. Strauss, just to mention that the figures on um, exposure for the common artery, so 54 million, is uh, EEA data, whereas the cases are uh, worldwide cases, the same for Moderna. It's EU exposure, but worldwide cases. I think the other thing that's important to say is that if you look at those uh, reports um, of blood clots um, with uh, thrombocytopenia for those other vaccines, and then compare them to the background rates, we would expect to see they are not raised. Thank you very much. We now have a question from Angela Mauro from the Huffington Post. Yes, thanks for the floor. I wanted to know, you've been saying that people who think they could have side effects, they, they, they should report it. Does this mean that you recommend these people to ask the national authorities or the physicians to be injected another vaccine uh, and not AstraZeneca? Could this be possible in, in, in the, the members? Are you recommending this? Thank you. Thank you. Strauss, yeah. oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much for that question, uh, because that helps me to clarify. It's a general uh, request, uh, because it's very important. The system relies on people uh, pro providing spontaneous reports of suspected adverse events, and that holds true actually for all medicines. That is very, very important, and more specifically for all vaccines that are being used. So my request was a general request that if people are vaccinated and they experience um, ADRs or uh, think that they might have adverse events, then please report them. But uh, actually the request is important for all medicines used because based on spontaneous data and analysis that we do, we can then uh, identify uh, whether or not um, the observed versus the expected occurrence is higher, and then we can further investigate. So it was a very general uh, request, uh, and, a very, uh, and in particular for the vaccines, because they are being rolled out in such a large population in a very short period of time. So we are depending on uh, people reporting adverse events, and that um, doesn't mean anything uh, regarding a specific vaccine at all. So thank you very much for that question and the possibility to further explain. Thank you very much. We are also now coming uh, almost to a close. I'm going to take one last question from Lyle Liverpool from The New Scientist. Lyle. Thank you. Um, so I had two questions, but, well, I'll just read them out. So um, firstly, what's the incidence of these rare blood clotting events specifically among women under 60, and how does that compare to the normal incidence rate among that particular group. Um, and then secondly, is the EMA recommending that countries such as Germany, which have suspended use of the vaccine for specific age groups, should resume use of the vaccine across all age groups? Thank you. Thank you very much. Those two questions are for Dr. Strauss, please. 
thank you. The uh, background incidence of the very rare cases of CVST is one to two per 100,000. Um, what we do have is a reporting incidence. So what we can give is how frequently has the event been reported and we have the exposure data. And based on that, it's very variable. Like I said, it depends on the uh, way that uh, things are being reported, the way that things are being uh, uh, analyzed in the different member states. And that's how we came up with, because in Germany, a lot of work has been done. And it seems that they have a very good reporting of these cases. And there we um, have a reporting rate of one in 100,000. But that doesn't mean the incidence rate. Um, so uh, that's a, a difference. Um, as for the um, recommendation, or the, uh, from what I have understood in Germany, it's that they recommend um, the AstraZeneca mainly for people above 60, and that if people below uh, that age range would like to have it, it's still possible that they receive the vaccine. Um, what we do here and with the PRAC committee, we try to provide as much information as possible on the benefits and on the risks that we have identified. And uh, based on that, the, and the uh, pandemic situation in a member state, the uh, infection rate, um, the availability of different vaccines, um, the different member states can take different decisions on who to vaccinate. Thank you very much. I use this opportunity to thank all our speakers, uh, and I want to thank you for all your questions. Please do not uh, hesitate to take a look at our website. We are providing there quite a lot of information also on the safety monitoring and the evaluation of vaccines. So thank you very much, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.